Uh, what happened to to San Louverture in the end of his life? Oh, I mean, it's terrible. I, I mean, and he wasn't that old, right? He's in his fifties at most, his late fifties. Mm-hmm. So, um, Toussaint or sixties, um, Toussaint Louverture uh, was arrested. So um, he went home actually. Back he fought the French for a while. After some of his key generals, including Dessalines and Christophe, appeared to defect to the French side momentarily, he said, mm-hmm. "You know what? I will retire." He went back home to his plantations, but the French knew that he was just this big threat. They accused him of all these things that just his existence there, right? Because of what he symbolized, the revolution and, mm-hmm. and uh, the end of slavery, that there was no way to bring back slavery while he was still there. Also because he was adamantly against it and he would have fought them tooth and nail. So they trick him into a meeting in June of 1802, um, a general, horrible general named General Brunet and arrest him, summarily arrest him, go back and arrest his wife his children, his 105-year-old godfather, deport them all to France, separate them. The letters from the time period are so heart-wrenching because he's, you know, wants news about his son. He wants to hear from his wife. His son wants news from him and from his mother. And they're trying to figure out what's happened. The French send this general, another terrible general, Cafarelli, who had also served in Saint-Domingue, to interrogate Louverture, get him to reveal all his plots. What Louverture does instead is write down what's known as his memoirs, there's four different versions. Um, and he had initially with him a kind of servant uh, or, you know, a waiting man um, who was someone who was was in that role when they were in Saint-Domingue named Max Plaisir, who writes down and takes dictation for him. For some of them, some are in Louverture's own hands, but the one that's most official is the one that Max Plaisir dictated. Suzanne Louverture tries to defend himself. He tries to tell Cafarelli he didn't do all of the things he's accused of. He was wants to be free in French, that he just wanted, you know, to be a good Republican. And mm-hmm. um, the French leave him in jail and his official uh, death date is April 7th, 1803. But when you read autopsy, excuse me, record, um, they yeah. didn't go in for a few days. So he that's the official date of death is um, April 7th, 1803. But he probably died a few days before that because he'd been complaining that his room, his cell was... Um, zero degrees Celsius, so freezing, um, that he had fevers, that he had a stomach ache, that he's coughing up blood, and there were blood in his lungs and on his lips when they found him, his head kind of resting on the chimney that had no wood in it and cold winter in the Fond de Joux, um, which is along the border of Switzerland. And um, so the French try to kind of cover up what they do at first. They don't report his death until the end of April when it just kind of leaks then the British get a hold of this and they're at war constantly back and forth with France. So they love saying that the French killed this illustrious black general. Um, and then it news gets to the United States, of course, to Saint-Domingue and it just propels the revolution forward even more. So this is April, 1803. Um, the, what's known as the Congress of Arcaille happens in May, 1803. And that's when all the revolutionaries come together and decide to change their motto from liberty or death to independence or death. 